Hi folks, so we're going to pick up where we left off here, talking about reproduction and the types of genetic replication organisms used to reproduce. So we talked about prokaryotes and the fact that prokaryotes use binary fission to go from a parent cell to daughter cells. And eukaryotes can use mitosis and meiosis to go from a parent cell to daughter cells. Um, and we also talked about how in the case of binary fission and mitosis, these daughter cells that are produced are genetically identical. So they're genetically identical to each other and they're genetically identical to the parent cell. So these daughter cells are genetically identical to this parent cell. These daughter cells are genetically identical to this parent cell. Whereas in meiosis, you get genetically unique daughter cells. So in this case, typically what you're producing are called sex cells or gametes from the parent cell. And they are not genetically identical to the parent cell. And we also said um, if you can recall, that binary fission is the process used by prokaryotes to reproduce asexually, while mitosis is the process that eukaryotes use to reproduce asexually. We had a couple different words for this type of reproduction in eukaryotes, whether it's called budding, vegetative reproduction, fragmentation, or parthenogenesis. All of these processes are types of asexual reproduction used by eukaryotes that require mitosis. And in all of these cases of asexual reproduction, whether you're a prokaryote or eukaryote, you end up producing genetically identical offspring, offspring that are identical to each other and identical to the parent, unless some sort of mutation happened during that process. And this is in contrast to meiosis, which is used by eukaryotes to reproduce sexually. And remember that this produces genetically unique offspring. Okay, so why don't all organisms reproduce the same way? Why go through all of this trouble to have meiosis and sexual reproduction and fertilization why not have everything reproduce asexually, okay? So the next couple slides are going to be about meeting these next learning objectives, which are to list the cost and benefits of sexual versus asexual reproduction. So we're going to talk about what are the advantages of reproducing sexually versus asexually, and the idea that each type of reproduction has its uh, costs and benefits, and therefore reproducing sexually or asexually is a type of evolutionary trade-off. Okay. So I want you to start off just thinking about asexual reproduction and some of the advantages you think an organism might have to reproduce asexually. So you can think about vegetative reproduction, you can think about budding, fragmentation, parthenogenesis, all those examples we've talked about before. What are some advantages of reproducing asexually? Go ahead and write those down. Okay, so I want to talk about what some of them are now that you've had some time to think about it and brainstorm. The first one is that an an, if an animal lives in isolation, if it can reproduce asexually, it can still reproduce. So in other words, um, if you have just a female colonize a habitat and that female doesn't need to have a male to reproduce with, she can produce more copies of herself and they can colonize that habitat. So there's no need to find a mate. And on top of that, all the energy that you have to expend to search out, seek out, and find a mate and court them and reproduce them is also very energetically expensive, okay? So you can imagine a lizard that's capable of parthenogenesis, so it can reproduce asexually. It arrives on this island, and it can make a whole bunch of copies of itself to survive for many, many, many generations without having to find a male mate, okay? So this is one advantage of asexual reproduction. Another important advantage of asexual reproduction is that it perpetuates successful combinations of genes. So we talked about how in asexual reproduction, the offspring are always genetically identical to the parent unless mutation occurs during that sort of cell duplication and replication process, okay? Whereas sexual reproduction breaks up those successful combinations of genes. So if you have a very, very stable environment that doesn't change very much, and you've got a combination of genes that work really, really well in that environment, it actually pays to keep those genes in that particular combination and not create a lot of genetic variation because that particular combination of genes and therefore that particular constant, uh, combination of traits is doing really well in that particular situation and habitat, okay? So this can actually be an advantage of asexual reproduction um, as long as you're in a very stable habitat. And the last major advantage that I wanna talk about of asexual reproduction is it creates lots of offspring very quickly relative to 
sexual reproduction that requires um, crossbreeding, okay? So let's talk about this in a little bit more detail. So asexual reproduction in general can be much more efficient because every individual can produce offspring. So if you think about asexual reproduction, in the case of asexual reproduction, pretty much every female acts functionally or every individual acts functionally like a female, where every individual is capable of producing offspring on their own, okay? So if you imagine in generation one, and for each individual in a population, each female is able to produce four copies of themselves, just given X amount of sort of constant energy in the population that's available, the resources that are available to each individual, okay? And then those four females are also capable of creating four females. So, so given no limitation, if each of these individuals is capable of making four copies of themselves, how many individuals are you gonna have in generation four? Okay, so in four it would be 64 individuals, or just four times each of these individuals, or four times 16. And you can play this out through generations such that the equation for how many individuals will be in any particular generation is just four to the x power minus one. So for example, in generation 11, x is 11, 11 minus one is 10, so it would be four to the 10th individuals in, pop, in the population generation 11, given no limitation on growth. So you'd have one million and uh, a little over a million individuals in that population. Whereas if you do the same comparison in a sexually reproducing uh, population, so this is once again assuming that you're a sexually reproducing uh, population with dioecious individuals. In other words, there's males and there's females. There's no hermaphrodites. Making that assumption, if you look at sexual reproduction that requires crossbreeding, you have two individuals to start off just to be able to reproduce, and only half of those individuals are actually capable of making more individuals. The males are not. And so this female can make two individuals. Um, and I'm sorry, they can make four individuals, but only two of those individuals just by chance are likely to be females. And so of the four the offspring that they produce, you got a 50-50 chance of having it be male or female. Half of them just by chance are females. Then you go into the next generation, so now you've got two females that can produce four offspring. And once again, half of those are females. And so you go from two to four to eight. And in the fourth generation, you'll have 16 individuals, only eight of whom, or half of which, will be females. And if you play this out all the way to the 11th generation, you'll get two to the X individuals in the population, whatever generation you're in. So in this case, it's two to the 11th. And so that's approximately 2000 individuals. So in the 11th generation, an asexually reproducing population, that's all females. You've got a million individuals after 11 generations, and you've only got 2000 individuals in a sexually reproducing population. So in terms of just pure numbers and number of individuals that you're able to produce and the efficiency of producing individuals, all things being equal, Sexual reproduction actually puts organisms at a big disadvantage because they don't multiply as efficiently as asexual organisms do, okay? So this is making assumption that you're working with dioecious organisms that have to have separate sexes and must cross-fertilize, but in general, this is true, where sexual reproduction puts you at a huge disadvantage. And in this case, you know, males are not just worthless, they're actually more than worthless more than worthless. They're worse than even useless because they're putting the population at a disadvantage in terms of its ability to grow, okay? So when we talk about the costs of sex, one major cost is that in general, when you're talking about sex, in as we typically think about it with crossbreeding dioecious organisms, in general, fewer offspring are produced relative to asexual reproduction. And the other part is it takes a lot of energy to find and breed with a mate, so it's much more energetically expensive too. So these are huge costs associated with sex. Okay, so given that, um, and this is a question that's sort of unrelated, I wouldn't expect you to know the answer to this, but given the major groups of organisms we know about, animals, plants, fungi, which of the following groups of organisms reproduce only asexually? Just take a guess at this. Which ones do you think only produce asexually? If you said none of the above, you'd be correct, okay? So animals are mostly sexual. Some are asexual, but mostly they reproduce sexually. Plants, same deal. They reproduce mostly sexually. And there's mostly dioecious organisms, and same deal with fungi. They produce mostly sexually and they have a lot of different mating types. So there are many asexually reproducing fungi. And so the point that I'm trying to drive home here 
is that despite these huge advantages that we just discussed about asexual reproduction, there's a ton of sexual reproduction that exists in nature, okay? So the tachomere is, despite its disadvantages relative to asexual reproduction, sex is a relatively common trait in eukaryotes. So why is that? Why do we see sex evolving, and why is it so prevalent in eukaryotic populations if it has so many costs relative to asexual reproduction, okay? So it must produce some sort of advantage that asexual reproduction does not. And there's actually two major hypotheses for why sex exists or why sex evolved. One is called the purifying selection hypothesis. The other is called the changing environment hypothesis or the red queen hypothesis is another word for it. And so I'm gonna talk about each of these hypotheses for why sex has evolved, starting with the purifying selection hypothesis, okay? So the purifying selection hypothesis basically says sex exists because sex removes bad genes from a population, okay? So you can imagine, um, a population of individuals that reproduce purely asexually via mitosis. And you can imagine in those individuals, there's this harmful gene or harmful mutation that's associated here, represented by this little star here on this chromosome right here. And so if you follow these chromosomes through mitosis and production of new cells or new individuals, you can see that all of the daughter cells that are reproduced are going to have that same chromosome and they're gonna have that same bad trait. So in other words, if a bad trait evolves or is present in a population, asexual reproduction guarantees that trait's gonna be present in all individuals in that population if they reproduce strictly asexually, okay? So overall, those individuals are gonna be less fit and overall, those individuals are gonna produce fewer offspring in the next generation. And so mitosis, because it produces exact genetic replicas, lots of bad mutations or genes are gonna be inherited in all the offspring of asexual parents. And this is in contrast to what we see in sexually reproducing organisms that reproduce by meiosis. So we have the same situation where you have this harmful or bad mutation here on a chromosome. That chromosome replicates itself. Then you have meiosis one, and these chromosomes split up to this cell, and these chromosomes split down to this cell. And then you have meiosis two, where the chromosomes split again, or the sister chromatids split apart. And then you have these gametes that are gonna get passed on to the subsequent generation. What you can see is only half of the gametes have that bad trait, whereas the other half of the gametes don't. So in other words, half of the individuals in the population have the potential to not get that bad trait. And so this is purifying the population, okay? In other words, you're removing or potentially removing that bad trait. So these individuals that get that trait are gonna be less fit, they're gonna have fewer offspring in the next generation. These individuals that don't get that bad trait or have lost that trait and get this other chromosome that don't have the bad allele or bad version of that trait are gonna be more fit. And so they're gonna have more offspring to contribute or more offspring to survive into the next generation, okay? So in other words, meiosis, because it creates unique gametes, those bad mutations or genes are not inherited by all the offspring, and that creates a competitive advantage. And so this is the purifying selection hypothesis, where sex is removing bad genes or it's purifying the population, okay? So the other major hypothesis for why sex exists is called the changing environment hypothesis, and this is sometimes called the red queen hypothesis too. The changing environment hypothesis basically says that Offspring are genetic clones of their parents or offspring that are genetic clones of their parents that are produced by asexual reproduction are unlikely to thrive in a changing environment, okay? So if environmental conditions change and everything is genetically identical and there's no variation, if a bad environment evolves and those populations don't have any variation in them, they're all gonna be selected against, okay? And so the classic example of this is the evolutionary arms race. And we can see this in lots of different places, but a great example of it is the evolutionary arms race between pathogens and hosts. And so remember, an arms race is all about someone gets one weapon, so you gotta get a slightly better weapon. And then someone gets another weapon that's better than yours, and someone else gets another better weapon that's yours, until you're building up these giant arsenals. And so the same thing happens with pathogens and hosts. So remember, a host organism gets infected by a pathogen, and then that host develops some sort of immunity to the pathogen, and then the pathogen develops some sort of resistance to that um, immunity, and then it goes back and forth over and over in a sort of arms race, with pathogens evolving new ways to infect hosts, and hosts evolving new ways to stop the pathogen. So in both cases, there's this sort of changing environment that they're dealing with. And the idea here is, let's say, for example, in the host, if there's no sex, then all hosts are genetic clones. 
There's no ability to get genetic variation in that population and potentially no avail uh, ability to evolve new ways to stop these pathogens, okay? And if you can't do that, then eventually the pathogen can win out and then the host itself is going to disappear, okay? So this is the idea of this changing environment hypothesis and the importance of creating variation to deal with environmental change through sexual reproduction, okay? So let's look at some of the experimental evidence for the changing environment hypothesis. And this is a study that was done using something called a roundworm, also called C. elegans, which is a classic sort of model organism. And the interesting thing about this roundworm C. elegans is that it can self or cross-fertilize, okay? So cross-fertilization is the same thing as what's called outcrossing. And remember that cross-fertilization creates a greater amount of genetic diversity than self-fertilization does, okay? So we're looking at self-fertilization, which is a type of sexual reproduction, versus cross-fertilization, which is another type of sexual reproduction, but involves fertilization with other individuals that have different alleles, okay? So different combinations of alleles. And when you cross-fertilize, you create a greater amount of genetic diversity in the population than you do when you self-fertilize, okay? And so the research question they had is if we expose this host, C. elegans, to an evolving pathogen, will it favor outcrossing or creating genetic diversity in the population, okay? And so the hypothesis here is that if you have C. elegans growing in an environment where there's evolving pathogens present, sexual reproduction by outcrossing should be favored. And this is basically the same idea of the changing environment hypothesis because having that evolving pathogen is the equivalent to having a changing environment where that pathogen can evolve and change and develop new ways to infect the host. Therefore, the host has to evolve and change to find new ways to avoid that pathogen. So you should have favoring of cross-fertilization, okay? And so this is the hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that if there's no um, changing environmental hypothesis, if the hypothesis, changing environmental pathesis is false, then the presence of evol evolving pathogens won't favor outcrossing. There shouldn't be any favoring of outcrossing versus self-fertilization. So this is the experimental setup. Basically what they did is started with a pathogen-free population of roundworms. They divided that population in half. So these little squiggly things here that you're looking at are the roundworms. They divide the population in half. Then they grow some population or subpopulation, half of them in the absence of a pathogen, and the other half of them in the presence of this evolving pathogen. And then what they did is they can look at the actual amount of outcrossing over many generations. So they can look at basically the genes in the population of these uh, roundworms and see how often outcrossing is occurring. Okay, so given this setup and the hypothesis, what does the changing environment hypothesis predict? All right, so if you said more outcrossing when the pathogen is present, that's exactly right. So the prediction is the rate of outcrossing should increase in response to exposure to the pathogen, and that's because there should be selection for individuals that outcross and have greater genetic diversity, whereas the rate of outcrossing should not be influenced by the pathogen if this hypothesis is false. There should be no difference in the rate of outcrossing between these two populations in the presence or absence of the pathogen. And this is, in fact, what we see. So this is a comparison of outcrossing versus generation time, and what you see is C. elegans that are grown in the presence of this pathogen or this changing environment have an increased rate of outcrossing, whereas those grown in this more stable environment that doesn't have a pathogen present in it do not outcross as much. And so the conclusion here is that exposing to or exposure to evolving pathogens actually favors outcrossing. And so this supports that changing environment hypothesis. Okay, so as a quick summary, let's look at the trade-offs of sexual reproduction versus asexual reproduction. So in asexual reproduction, the benefits are that number one, it's more efficient than sexual reproduction, at least sexual reproduction that requires outcrossing. So in dioecious organisms where you have separate sexes and it maintains favorable allele combinations in a stable environment. The cost of this of course is that asexual reproduction limits the amount of genetic variation that can be generated in the population. Now, if you look at the benefits of sexual reproduction, it's the opposite. So it enhances genetic variation and it can eliminate unfavorable alleles from the population, but it has this big cost of being less efficient where overall fewer progeny are reproduced and it has a, has a higher energy investment because males have to seek out females or one sex or one sort of mating type has to seek out another mating type. 
and there's a potential loss of effective genetic combinations. So if you're in a very stable environment where you have a really good combination of alleles, those can get broken up by sexual reproduction, okay? And so the general predictions here is that asexual reproduction should be favored in more stable environments, and sex, whereas sexual reproduction should be favored in less stable environments where variation helps deal with change, okay? And in fact, um, some organisms have evolved to have sort of the best of both worlds, okay? So this is just an example of something called the water flea or a daphnia, and it can both sexually and asexually reproduce depending on whether it's in favorable or less favorable conditions. So for example, um, when it's in favorable conditions where there's an abundant food supply in warm temperatures, it can have this asexual parthenogenic life cycle. So it can produce lots and lots and lots of individuals and it'll only produce females. But when less, less favorable conditions come on, so maybe there's a decreased food supply, there's cooler temperatures, there's overcrowding, there's accumulation of waste or toxins, it can actually switch to the sexual life cycle where it produces males and females that will fertilize each other to make this cyst life stage, which is a resting life stage that can basically survive through dinner, uh, winter. It can go into this resting stage, wait out these less favorable conditions. And so this organism gets the both best the benefits of both, the best of both worlds, so to speak, okay? So you should understand why sex is both dis and advantageous and what conditions typically favor sexual versus asexual reproduction. So to that end, which of the following statements are true regarding sexual reproduction? All right, if you said both A and B are true, that is absolutely correct. And finally, as a sort of follow-up activity, just to quiz yourself, see if you can list the costs and benefits of asexual versus sexual reproduction, and explain what type of environment might favor sexual versus asexual reproduction.